Hi, and welcome again to my series of videos for Physical Chemistry 2. In the last video, we looked at the entropy and how our definition of entropy can be adapted to ensembles containing a large number of molecules. In that video, we derived this equation. As you might recall, the subscript i indicates the energy state, so p sub i is the probability that a molecule in the ensemble is in the energy state i. But wait, how do we calculate that? Is there a way we can predict the probability that a molecule is in a given energy state? Well, the short answer is yes, but it'll take a bit of thinking in order for us to determine how to do it. To begin, let's imagine a very generic chemical system. This could contain any combination of atoms and molecules, and any number of them. Usually, we imagine that the number of particles is very large, on the order of Avogadro's number. We'll call the energy of the system E, and the microstates in this system are called omega. Outside of the system is what we'll call the reservoir. The reservoir is a portion of the environment that the system can interact with. The part of the environment beyond the reservoir is too far away from the system for the system to interact with it. This way, we don't have to think about the entire environment, which consists of the whole universe, when we think about how the system and environment interact. The energy of the reservoir is called ER, and the number of microstates the reservoir can have is omega R. Also, the total energy is called E sub T, and the total number of possible microstates is omega T. Now, if the entropy of the system decreases, the entropy of the reservoir must increase. And the same is true for the energy. Energy is conserved, so a change in the energy of the system is accompanied by an opposite change in the energy of the reservoir. Now, the reservoir almost always contains many more particles than the system does, so ER, the energy of the reservoir, is much, much larger than E, the energy of the system. Also, the number of microstates that the reservoir can have is much, much higher than the number of microstates the system has. Suppose we're interested in a microstate I of the system. Pi is the probability that the system is in that microstate. When the system is in that microstate, there are many different microstates that the reservoir could be in. For each microstate I that the system can be in, there's a different number of microstates for the reservoir, and it turns out that the more probable I is, the higher the number of microstates in the reservoir. We can express that using this equation. The probability that the system is in state i is equal to the number of microstates in the reservoir over omega t, the overall total number of microstates that the system and reservoir can have. This equation is quite true, but it's actually very hard to use. The problem is this term. It's easy for us to study the system, but the reservoir is often very difficult to study. That means we'd like to replace omega r with some property of the system that's easy for us to predict. How can we do that? Well, remember this equation that was proposed by Ludwig Boltzmann. This tells us that the number of microstates is connected to the entropy. We're trying to find a way to replace this term in the probability equation. So maybe we can start by thinking about the entropy of the reservoir, S sub r. Unfortunately, properties of the reservoir, like SR and ER, are very difficult to measure. However, it turns out that the total energy is much easier to determine. And since the reservoir is so much larger than the system, ER is very close to the total energy, ET. That gives us a good way to approximate SR, the entropy of the reservoir. SR is close to what it would be if the energy of the reservoir was the same as ET. In order to get the exact value of SR, we need to use a correction term that will subtract a little to account for the fact that the energy of the reservoir is a little less than ET. Here's that correction term. It consists of 
e sub i, which is the energy of the microstate that the system is in, multiplied by this partial derivative, which tells us how much the entropy changes as we change the energy. This doesn't look like a very useful equation, but it's actually easier to use than it might seem. Here's why. It turns out that the partial derivative in this equation is related to a property that you've seen many times before. The partial derivative of energy with respect to entropy is actually the definition of temperature. That means that the partial derivative in the equation is equal to 1 over the temperature. So we can rewrite it like this. Now let's use Boltzmann's equation to put this expression in terms of omega, the number of microstates. On the left side, we'll replace SR with this. Next, we'll replace the first term in the right hand of the equation with this. Why did we do that? Well, remember, we're trying to come up with a way to determine the probability that the system is in a certain energy state, I. And in order to do that, we need to have an expression for omega r. So with that in mind, let's solve this equation for omega r. We divide both sides by kb. And then we eliminate the logarithm by raising e to the exponent represented by each term in the equation. That gives us omega r on the left side of the equation and omega r at energy et times e to the power negative ei over kb times t on the left side. So now we have an expression for omega r and we can plug that into the numerator of the equation for probability, which gives us this. This looks like it's as difficult an equation to use as the one we had before. The two terms in the fraction will both be hard to calculate. But actually, that fraction will now be very easy to get rid of. Here's how we do it. Remember, pi is the probability that the system is in state i. We know that the sum of the probabilities for all the energy states must be equal to 1, so we can rewrite our equation this way. The fraction doesn't depend on i, so we can take it out of the summation sign. But wait, this means we can solve this equation for the fraction by dividing both sides by the summation, which gives us this. Now we can combine that equation with our earlier expression for the probability, which gives us this. And that is a very important result. Why is this equation useful? Well, now we finally have an equation for the probability that doesn't require us to know anything about the reservoir. In fact, the only things we need to know are the temperature and the energies of the system's microstates. Those are things we should be able to measure. Plus, remember that we got this equation by thinking about a very generic system. So we should be able to generalize this equation to apply to almost any real system. There's one more important feature of this expression. Take a look at the denominator. We got that term by making sure that the probabilities pi add up to 1. In other words, this summation is a normalization factor, and it's an expression that appears in lots of different equations in physics and chemistry. It's called the partition function, and it gets its own symbol, q sub t. Basically, the partition function tells us how molecules get distributed, or partitioned, into the different microstates of the system. Let's see what these equations are telling us and what we can do with them. Suppose we have a system that can have six different microstates. Those microstates have energies of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6 times 10 to the minus 21 joules. What will be the probability of each of those microstates at 200 Kelvin? To solve this, we need to calculate pi for each of the six microstates. The denominator will be the same in each of the six probability fractions, so let's calculate the denominator first. It's a sum of six terms, 
each of which is e raised to the power of the negative of the energy over Boltzmann's constant times the temperature, which is 200 K. That gives us this result for each of the six terms. When we add them together, we get a value of 2.03038. Now we can plug that into the probability equation. For example, for microstate 1, we'll have this expression. We already figured out that the numerator is equal to this, and the denominator is 2.0308, which gives us a probability of 0.3429. If we perform a similar calculation for the other microstates, we find that P2 is 0.2387, P3 is 0.1662, P4 is 0.1156, P5 is 0.0805, and P6 is 0.0561. There are a couple of things to notice about that result. First of all, notice that the probabilities add up to exactly 1. That's just as it should be, and the reason why it worked that way is because of the partition function, the denominator in the probability equation. Remember, the partition function is a normalization factor for the probability. The other thing to notice is that the probability is highest for the first microstate. That also makes sense. We know that a system is most stable when it has the lowest energy possible, so we'd expect the probability to be higher for microstates with lower energies. Let's try that problem again with the same system and the same microstates but this time with a higher temperature, 300 Kelvin, instead of 200. Once again, we'll start by calculating the partition function. We have an expression with six terms again, and if we calculate each term, we get this. Adding them together gives us 2.8021 for the partition function. When we now calculate the probabilities, we find out that P1 is 0.2804, P2 is 0.2202, P3 is 0.1730, P4 is 0.1358, P5 is 0.1067, and P6 is 0.0838. Once again, the probabilities add up to 1, as they should. And once again, the highest probability is for the microstate with the lowest energy. However, notice that this time, the lower energy states are less probable than they were at 200 Kelvin, and the higher energy states are more probable than they were. That makes sense. You might recall from our discussion of the velocity distribution in PCHEM1 that the distribution gets wider as the temperature increases. So higher energy states are more highly populated at higher temperatures. Let's try one more example. We'll use the same system again, but this time we'll raise the temperature all the way to a million Kelvin and see what happens. This time, the calculation for the partition function looks like this. Adding those terms gives us a value of 5.9985. When we now calculate the probabilities, we find that P1 is 0.1667, P2 is 0.1667, P3 is 0.1667, and so is P4. P5 is 0.1666, and P6 is also 0.1666. Once again, these add up to 1, but look at those probabilities. They're all essentially the same. When we increased the temperature from 2 to 300 Kelvin, we saw that the probabilities of the lower energy microstates decreased, and the probabilities of the higher energy ones increased. Now that we've increased the temperature dramatically to a million Kelvin, we can see that the probabilities of the low energy states decreased even more, and the high states increased so that all the probabilities are now nearly the same. This is generally true. 
As the temperature rises, it becomes more and more likely that the molecules in the system can have any energy state with equal probability. Before we finish up, let's look at this equation one last time. This tells us the probability that the system is in microstate I. However, we usually don't know the microstate a system is in. We'd usually rather know the probability that a system has a particular energy, E, not a particular microstate. To calculate that, we just need to modify this equation slightly by including the degeneracy of the microstate in the numerator, which gives us this. Well, that's enough new material for now. We now know the probability that a system will have a given energy. But one thing we don't know yet is how that energy will be distributed among the different forms of motion, rotational, vibrational, and translational. That's what we'll look at in the next video. I hope you'll join me for that. But in the meantime, have a good week.